Over the course of my brief stint here on YouTube, every series featured so far has had at least one game in it that I've played previously, but I'm not solely dedicated to the more well-known series. I've got a soft spot for indie developers, those that are willing to put their nose to the grindstone to churn out a product built from a passion of the medium against the odds of AAA competitors. One such game that fits that bill is, um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find it here. Uh, sorry, it would be really easy to find if I had a layout of the space, maybe on a piece of parchment or something. This, ah, here it is. Owlboy. This is an open world game that doesn't have a map. Reddit.com slash r slash owlboy slash comment slash mqf2dg slash post underscore map slash. That is the only map I could find. I'll, uh, I'll leave this here for you. Pick it up. When you think of owls, what are the first things that come to your mind? For me, it's that they're to be respected, to be revered, to be exalted. That's what the game tells me anyway. Then there's Otis. Half owl, half boy. Do you get the picture? All of those things I listed off? Otis's teacher of Owl 101, Asio, in some weird dream sequence want to make it abundantly clear that Otis fits none of these characteristics. Though Otis is a mute, so if this verbal abuse keeps up, I think we can try to catch Asio for a hate crime. Where do you think this would chalk up on Anti-Defamation League's 2016 list of top 10 hate crimes? That's an actual article. Asio's role in Otis's life at the moment is to teach him things like how to fly, classroom knowledge, and carrying jugs of water. The essentials, really. Since Otis is shown to be a failure at all of these tasks, Agio scolds Otis in his home, Otis scolds his throat in his home, and Agio assigns him to the duties for the day, which is to keep an eye out for pirates. That should really be no problem, though, though hey, Agio, are these pots full of treasure on the ground meant to be pirate traps, or are we really asking for it? Also, I've noticed the shadowed figure hopping about, and, and I know that you said to report anything suspicious, but it's time for my 15. Here we come across Otis's best friend in the whole town of Veli Getty. He's a soldier, maybe guard, I'm not entirely sure, but he's incredibly nice to Otis and he's a full human rather than something seemingly mixed together like Otis. That leaves the creation of owls like Otis a little ambiguous. I caught an owl, Batman. I, I caught an owl. Oh no, Joker. Don't tell me. You already know, Batman. You know what I'm gonna do to that thing. Continuing to interact with the locals of Veli, Otis comes across a man playing the bongos named Bombo Man, who mentions having seen pirates from a lookout point to the west of here, but decided not to report it until asked. I'm imagining Bombo Man being the type of guy to get robbed, but only fessing up when a neighbor made a noise complaint. Saw man run. Had big gun. After heading to the lookout, thankfully Otis finds nothing, but another little owl comes and scares him suddenly. This owl's name is Fib, and he and his friend Bonacci are pretty unimportant to the story, but while they're here, it feels like an appropriate time to acknowledge the variation in owls visually. These are both creatures of the same species, yet Fib and Fettuccini both look a lot more like what you'd think of when you think of a normal owl. So Otis must have dominant human alleles and recessive owl alleles, where Fib and Linguini have recessive human alleles and dominant PUSS BOY alleles! You got scared off by this?! Getty offers to help Otis keep an eye out for the pirates and joins the party. After getting up to a little friendly mischief and causing some property damage, Otis and Getty head over to Veli's laboratory, where the professor is showing Asio what is essentially like a GPS or a VOR, I don't- One of those things in the movies where there's like a screen and they got that line spinning around and it shows dots that are like other things in the proximity, whatever the hell those are. Asio thinks it's pointless because they have maps. Maps that the owls keep up to date. Yeah, where are they then? I'd love to see one. Whip one out right now, big boy! I'll take whatever you got! Back outside, Fib and Tortellini are bullying another owl. This owl's name is Solus, who is a classmate to the other two, who seems too nervous to stand up for himself. And stand you shall know more! Our shadowy figure is back at it again, and we may have been on break last time, but this time, I've got my Ged, I've got my Gat, a second strike and baby, I'm still on probation. The two follow this figure into a nearby cave, and whatever it's meant to be tries to block the path to no avail, and as they continue deeper and deeper, a portion of the cave crumbles, separating Otis and Getty from one another. It's not long before they regroup, though, as Getty successfully dug a hole and worked his way over to an area that he somehow knew Otis would go by. Now look, I wouldn't consider myself to be a petty person. But, with the lack of map that this game provides, I ended up stitching together a bunch of screenshots to see where Otis and Getty got separated was in relation to where they got back together, and like, listen, I want to concede to the idea that Getty could have dug into this wall and worked his way around to where they met up. 
but they got separated by a pile of rocks that I can't tell the width of. We're playing by 2D logic, lads! Which means Getty would have to have worked his way up from somewhere around here, but he's a little short for that. There are hybrid human owls. Maybe Getty is a fox person burrowing. Sorry, anyways, can I tell you about my tortoise friend now? He's really cute. Oh, Getty, no, don't eat the tortoise. We were just gonna hang out. I'm learning so much today. Pressing further in, Getty points out some sort of ancient owl relic. While they're observing, our trickster friend comes out of nowhere to tie them up. They escape. And that's your padding for the moment. Getty wants to break off a bit of the relic to take back to the Professor and Veli, so he gives it a whack, causing the whole thing to shatter, revealing a device that was inside. This device has a button that, when pressed, teleports Getty, but at the cost of Otis losing a few brain cells. Otis, are you right there, big guy? Otis? Otis? Otis! Hey, is everything okay? You're alright, let's, let's get out of here, alright? Actually, do you want to go back inside? It was kind of cozy and I saw a stack of Sudokus in there. I've never been a fan, but I'm feeling motivated to become one. So naturally, while Otis was out, pirates started invading Veli. Dodging the line of sight of these ships, Gotis. I'm just gonna start calling them that. It seems easier than saying both their names every single time. Find solitude with Asio and the Professor, and following this is a scene of two pirates. For as short of a time as they were here for, it seems like they got what they wanted already. The pirate on the left mentions having grabbed a relic, and if they're already good to go, I think their intentions may have been more pure than Asio led us to believe. <laughs> Banana. The professor gets things up and running just in time to notice that the pirates are fleeing, so him and Asio call a town meeting. Based off the readings the professor got, the pirates are headed towards the capital, Advent. Asio mentions using something called the Owl Temple to defend against them. Listen, I know it has to be written in a certain way because we haven't had a lot of time with these characters. But we don't call them human temples! Why does the owl call it the owl temple? There are wind generators in the temple that have been preventing floating islands from crashing into each other, so the professor hopes to turn them off and crush the slowly ascending pirate ships. Since Gotis are being held responsible for the invasion, they are told to go take care of the wind generators while Agio and the professor go to warn Advent about the pirates' arrival. Gotis now enter a place called Tropos. There's nothing really of note going on here, save for a funny little vortex forming at the top with a funny little guy in a robe chanting incantations from a funny little book called Nocte. Well, my friend, I will not be so easily swayed by your witchcraft. Kiss my Noctaint! <laughs> Inside the vortex is the Owl Temple, which puts on display the extent of the owl's vanity. We've got owl statues, owl shields, owl doors, owl ruins, owl fountains, owl hieroglyphs, owl hoops, owl hoops! It's hard to tell what the extent of the temple's utility was. There's a lot of indoor segments, outdoor segments, but temple makes me think that it's a place of worship, and I know there's a tax for that. And as a contributing member of society, I know I gotta pay the fish tax, baby! How you doing, big man? <laughs> Progressing through here is mostly done by wringing water out of clouds, and there's even a point where Otis has to jump up some rocks against the force of a waterfall, which like, okay, wow! There's also some cute lizard enemies that are defeated once they get wet. The stranger part about them being around at all is that they mainly hang out in areas near water. D does that make sense? That would be the equivalent of humans living at the base of a volcano. Oh. Gnomes! I'm over here stroking my dick. I got lotion on my dick right now. I'm just stroking my shit. Damn, my bad. Gnomes! This is another stealth mission because, and I didn't know this, gnomes are sensitive to sound. I, I don't know, I've only ever played as a halfling. So flapping the wings is a no-go. Except for when it's not because their stubby little legs can't catch up. Past the gnomes is another waterfall for Otis to scale. So I just got to this area. I scale the platforms because that's what you've taught me to do. Now you break it on me and I can't progress without going to a different room first. So just, just send me to that room. Why are you wasting my time? It seems that the two pirates from before have ended up here too and aren't looking to be in the best shape. One of them notices Otis in the corner and wants to steal Otis's owl cloak. Wait, wait, what? So his wings are literally a magical piece of clothing. He's just a guy! The pirate on the left hops inside the ship and the battle ensues. You have to fight one of them in the air and bait the other into shooting debris that falls onto the ship. In my notes for this part, I wrote Dirk fight. This one's name's Dirk. 
Dirk fires turret into rock. That hurts ship. Owie! <laughs> Gotus defeat them, and while the one pirate admits defeat, Dirk is not about to go admit anything. And after this pirate questions the pirate captain Molstrom's devotion to his crew, the trickster from earlier arrives and takes off alongside Dirk. The remaining pirate leaves and apologizes for the scratches he left on Otis. Yeah, less like scratches and more like second degree burns. Gotus follow the pirate further into the temple and he seems to be having a hard time traversing the area by himself and offers to team up with Gotus and reaffirms that he no longer has any allegiance to the pirates. His name is Alphonse. Okay, this messes up the whole Gotus thing. It's It'll be Ghetto Fonz from now on. And he has a flaming musket that is used to proceed towards our eventual demise via horrific frog monstrosity. Of all the things I've been learning today, science being a sham wasn't one I was expecting. I'm gonna put a screenshot of rust on the screen because that joke did not make that very clear. Just past the frog is the control room we came for where Getty identifies that the wind turbines weren't on in the first place and looked as though they had been broken for decades. So no crushy the pirate you professy's gonna be so mad at us. The boys follow the back exit out of the temple and make it to Advent surprisingly quickly. Getty seems worried about the storm we've entered into, and Alphonse doesn't like getting his little booties wet, so he's staying behind. Honestly, guys, it's just a bit of rain. You don't have anything to be worried about. It's gunfire! It's gunfire! You really can't have anything in Ohio! Needless to say, Asia isn't the happiest with us having not shut down the wind turbines. And even as Getty tries to explain that they were never on, Asia dismisses it as them slacking off. This professor, named Kernel, tells him to defend Advent instead of being insufferable. And there's another owl named Strix that is genuinely unimportant. They leave in order the rest to stay because we wouldn't want any pirates entering the building. Pirate in the building! Alphonse thinks we should stop the pirate attack on Advent. And it's funny, I think everyone in Advent was thinking the same thing. He tells of the largest of the pirate ships, the Dreadnought, and how he wants to sneak in and blow it up from the inside. Kernel is skeptical of our group, partially because they're conspiring with a pirate while pirates are attacking, but mainly because Solus is a narc and he might rat on them. She is ultimately convinced though, and they exit the building and sneak onto the front lines on an ally airship. This brings them very high up into an area that the pirates have taken over, which means more stealthing. I didn't want to do a Metal Gear bit. Colonel, the pirates are after my booty. And my ass. There's a very startled soldier up here who seems to be regretting taking that signing bonus that informs that the demolition squad that was sent up here has been captured. Are they going to help us blow up this ship? Uh, no. But they'll help you break the barricades that will lead you to the ship. You drive a hard bargain. After more stealthing, Ghetto Fonz find the first demolition crew member, and who has the dynamite we need, but also kicks major ass? <laughs> Can you join our party? Preying on pirates in the shadows leads them to the second demo squad member, Bonanza, who is absolutely sick. Can you join our party? I guess not. Past here, there's a mini airship fight, a shower of bombs that you're probably meant to maneuver through, but it's fun to just tank the whole thing. There's another mini airship. Can I just see the big one? I, I only care about the big one. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> the laser's supposed to hit the floating rocks, not you, silly guy. Why would you let that happen? The boys slip into the dreadnought and are soon met with the ship's engine. Getty gets a bit trigger-happy and suffocates it. Oh, yeah. Everything's fun in games until you have to get saved by the feeder kid. What a weird detail. Alphonse grabs the others and hobbles his way out of the engine room. Otis wakes up. They escape to the side door and start celebrating. Whoa! Guys, you did it! You saved Advent! Hey, Dirk! Oh, you don't like us. <laughs> Dirk wants revenge on Alphonse for turning his back on the pirates, but before any altercation can ensue, from the ship emerges Captain Molstrom. Molstrom's presence is so intimidating that Alphonse poofs out of existence. Captain M has next to no interest in Otis or Getty and gently relieves them of their position on the ship. He raids the streets of Advent with the power of the relic from Veli, and what follows is one of the most beautifully tragic shots I've ever seen in a video game.
Otis wakes up after an uncertain amount of time inside Mandolin's house, and once talking to her, she updates Otis that Veli has started taking in refugees from Advent. Getty is mourning at Veli's new graveyard, and Agio has stayed at the lookout for days and won't talk to anyone. If we're looking for a silver lining, Agio's solitude is probably great for local morale. While heading over to the graveyard, Otis is interrupted by Solus, who seems to be taking the raid particularly hard and is fleeing Veli. Once talking to Getty, he mentions the guilt that he feels that they weren't able to stop the invasion despite all the effort they put in. Despite this, he feels no guilt asking Otis if he can stay at his place, knowing full well that he's a mute and can't say no. On to Agio, Otis catches him monologuing to himself, saying that if the pirates collect all three relics, they're doomed. After that, he notices Otis behind him and says he doesn't want to see him again. I don't know whether to read that as in, like, this immediate vicinity or Veli in general, but he seems to be a bit moody for the moment, so it's probably best not to stick around. Out from the bushes comes Alphonse, looking for a chit-chat back at Otis's. Yeah, guys, don't worry, let yourselves in. Keep your shoes on, too, while you're at it. Lovely. Alphonse's conversation topic for today is the history of pirates and owls. Alphonse, really? It's Diddy Kong racing in Wings Night. You're killing the vibe! The pirates are not natural beings, but were created by the owls long ago, originally made as servants for the owls to each perform a particular function. After some time, the ancient owls vanished, leaving these servants without purpose. Molstrom's original purpose was to be used for war and destruction, and with nobody to point him at a target, he ended up deciding that seeking power was close enough. He set his sights on the three ancient owl relics, two of which have been found now post-Advent Raid. In the process, he exterminated anyone that opposed him, adopted the pirate moniker, and threw on a fake beard on his robot Chinny Chin Chin, which is real king behavior. Honestly, you're kind of killing it. Alphonse thinks that if Molstrom is able to get a hold of that third relic, he would be unstoppable. But Alphonse, do you know where he's going to find the third relic? <laughs> he's going to the floating continent, of course. Floating continent? Well, I don't know if you noticed, but they're all floating! After leaving Veli, we're shown again a shot of Molstrom putting away his second relic, and actually that hooded figure from outside the Owl Temple is with him. Now, I'm not saying that if we bump into them again, we should capture them and maybe extort information from them, but, but now that I mention that, that sounds like a swell idea. Whoa, <laughs> hey there! You doing all right? They start up selling the floating continent, calling it the greatest of the owl homes, and it was where the owl tech was able to go beyond the capabilities of life itself. So they say, according to the Book of Nocte. Okay, look, this is the second time you've mentioned this book. What is What does that even mean? What is that? I want you to treat me like I'm a stupid little baby. Ghetto Fonz continue into a cave which is meant to be the floating continent, but when I'm thinking of a continent, I'm thinking of like a large landmass, not a cave inside a large landmass. To be perfectly honest, this floating continent section of the game is by far my least favorite. I almost completely dropped Owl Boy because of how frustrating I find it to have been designed. To keep me from ping-ponging between plot and complaints, let me get the major one out of the way and we'll be done. Everyone, let's talk about light. We're in a cave, so naturally light might be hard to come by, but some areas will be pitch black, riddled with spikes that you can't see, going down a path that you can't navigate, and then frames later you'll be met with the light of a thousand suns. You can see some light pouring in through the skybox, but personally it feels more like an afterthought to justify it. It really feels like a gimmick that was added in later, because honestly, I think if visibility was cranked all the way up, this section would be fairly easy. However, I would much prefer an easier dungeon to work through than having the difficulty Difficulty be artificially turned up by throttling my line of sight, lining a thin path with spikes and enemies while having flies attack me so I have to try and navigate it faster so I take more damage than I should from spikes and enemies, and also flies and they're buzzing, they keep buzzing. Do you see the problem here? It's not fun. That's this whole section. Let's continue. Our group comes across Dirk and the trickster- his name is Twig. I can't remember when they mention it, but I'm over the ambiguity. Dirk and Twig have found the third relic, but before they can get their hands on it, a defense mechanism kicks in and takes off with it, so they take off too. A good chunk of the floating continent is sort of a cat and mouse game with Dirt and Twig. Ghetto fawns catch up to them, they run away with dialogue that, like before, feels like unnecessary padding. After winding through the cave's passages, a boulder slams through the ground, giving access to a deeper, lava-filled area. 
finding Dirk and Twig again. Dirk mocks Alphonse for joining us, and Twig tries to hop in too, like a little brother would. Like, yeah, yeah, you tell him, and, and your mom's hot too. But Dirk says that he's a loser too and doesn't need him anymore, activates some electricity monster from the ceiling, and flees. Adding to this unfortunate dungeon is an equally unfortunate boss, armed with electric spheres, a whip of an arm, and a body the size of Germany. But like, pre-Treaty of Versailles. I think that's correct? I don't remember a lot about history. It happened so long ago. Another example of padding after this boss, get this. The platform that they've been fighting on is a teleporter that takes them back to Tropos so that they can lift up some owl statues, go back through the teleporter to find that the way forward has been opened. Maybe this was to give Dirk extra time to find the relic, but between fighting the boss and doing all this teleport stuff, he gained 9 minutes and 15 seconds on them. Most of that time, he seems to have spent tugging away at the relic without finding a way to release it from its security mechanism. Once they see him struggling so much, he gets embarrassed and flees. Unable to release the relic, they advance to find a computer that has text written in Ancient Owl, which thankfully Alphonse is able to read. The text is phrased as though it's some kind of log recording progress on a project. There are a few of these computers riddled about, and again, to keep from ping-ponging, I'll go over them now. The computers talk about an excavation process, infighting on the project, a light cradle, a complex hex machine, and that the original writer hopes that the project will be complete in their lifetime. Yeah, I feel that way about the O train, bro guy, I understand. A new writer continues on about the completion of the hex machine, how tests have been successful, they've been drawing power from the continent to transfer it into the relics, and once they have enough energy, they will be able to put the hex machine to whatever purpose it was made for. The next computer outlines my gut health, but we don't need to go too in-depth about that one. The final computer simply reads, The hex is complete, the world is destroyed, looping. And looping back around to what happened in between all that, I dropped Getty in some lava. Oops! I learned that monkeys are so illiterate that even being in the presence of texts freezes them in their tracks, and there are a lot of owl screws, and a few of them activate serpent statues. With everything always being owl-themed, I hadn't really understood the reference to serpents, and I certainly won't act like I knew that snakes were a favorite snack of owls, but knowing that now, I can't get the image of Otis wrapping his little tongue around one of these out of my head. Once all of these owls screws have been screwed in, a sea of lava erupts from the ground, leaving Otis to fly for his life out of the passages to the surface. Upon reaching the surface, Otis is met with a surface- Wait, no, Otis, keep it together! <laughs> This part is really lame. Otis is riding a rock serpent that you have to control, and the perspective is always shifting, so you don't have a firm grasp on what is supposed to be up or down, which is really frustrating when your main character's skull is grinding along the inside of a cave. Otis travels so far on the back of this creature that they end up in a snow biome, and Twig grabs a hold of Otis before the creature rams into a cliffside. After regrouping with everyone, Twig gets maybe a little too comfortable with them, which Getty is not a fan of, having not appreciated him working with the pirates. Twig admits he was only hanging out with them because he was lonely, which Getty doesn't really see as a good reason and looks to the others for backup, but fails to realize that one of the people that he's looking at is a literal pirate. Alphonse acknowledges this, but Getty says it's not the same at all, because a pirate seeming to be less rude and pillagey than the other pirates is a much more credible alibi than someone just looking to hang out. In a fit of rage, Getty decides that he doesn't want to be a part of the group anymore, and teleports back to Veli. And this, I don't understand. I've been turning a blind eye to the other instances of this happening, but Otis is the one with the teleportation device, and if he wants to teleport the boys into a room to recon, that makes sense. In this situation, however, I find it much less likely that Otis, instead of having them all talk it out, ironically, would just be like, yeah man, that's tough. I, I guess we'll see you back at camp then. Twig feels bad about this exchange and flees, but as Otis and Alphonse wander around this snowy place, he turns back and offers to give them a hand around and joins the party. There's too many parties changes. I shouldn't have done this name idea. Now I'm stuck with Twig Fawns. Twig's abilities allow him to latch onto faraway objects and tie up enemies in knots. On the other side of this area, Twig Fawns arrive outside a small village that is being accosted by pirates. They've come at the tail end of the inspection being done by the pirates on Twig's family, and as the pirates leave, Twig rushes over to check in on them. Inside their home, right as Twig is trying to introduce his family to Otis, his brother cuts him off to scold him for wanting to look like a spider rather than a a, a stick bug? Is that what's going on? I honestly couldn't tell what this was. A, a stick bug named Twig. Th that's a little too on the nose for me. Well, you wanted to wait until after they were born to give our kid a name. Have you thought of anything yet? 
Anthropod. <sighs> That's beautiful. They ask him to take his costume off, and when he does, his dad says he just wanted to ask a few questions without him looking like an idiot. Bro! When asked if he's still gonna hang out with the pirates, he admits that they ditched him, so probably not. His family seems pretty accepting of Otis, at least, and after this interaction, they head back outside to recollect Alphonse and explore the surrounding area some more to find a massive door. Also, while talking about how this is most likely the door to a pirate base, which, being so close to Twig's family, wouldn't bode too well if the pirates decide to go down the residential development route, Alphonse very offhandedly mentions that Dirk probably grabbed the last relic before the cave flooded? What? H how would he have- The group heads back to Twig's house to warn his family of the pirate base, but they're maybe a little too proud and don't want to let the pirates intimidate them out of their home. Alphonse teleports in to intimidate them by threatening the construction of a sprawling citadel, and the most horrific part, a Harvey's on the main floor. Daddy Sticky sees through the act and supports him leaving with the others, reminding him that this will always be his home. His brother also brings up that there's a waterfall in Tropos that will take them directly inside the pirate base and offers to point them in the right direction. Brief intermission of Dirk dropping off the last relic. How would he have- Twig's brother guides the team to a secret passage beneath their house that leads them back to the wide open world to have them beeline it for the waterfall he mentioned. Just Beyond There brings them back to the snow biome Mesos. I hadn't mentioned that's what it was called, but you saw the chapter marker, right? We're fine. So basically, the entirety of the area east of Veli Antropos is frozen just like that, huh? This is what I imagine southern state Americans think it's like to cross the border. Middle seat in an economy, thrown on their Eddie Bauer jacket, like, no dude, it's 38 and humid. Upon entering the pirate base, Twigofons are met with a few robo-pirates and flying bombs guarding the way to the recently groundbound dreadnought. Once they board the ship, they find it in a complete lockdown, and with no other way to progress, they look towards the ducks to navigate the most convoluted system I've ever seen. I know the Ancient Owls gave the pirates specific functions, but HVAC Fanatic wasn't one I was expecting. Reaching the end of the path, Alphonse hops into a hole in the wall which opens up a door for Otis and Twig to continue through. Once Otis and Twig make it past the door though, they don't teleport him back as they normally would, which has him absent for a good majority of the time spent on the ship. While he's gone, there's not a crazy amount of things that happen other than one scene where Otis overhears Dirk and Molstrom talking about an Owl boy! Molstrom says he comes and goes, but no longer serves a purpose, which is crazy, because this implies that he knew that Otis and the others were trying to stop them, but they were using them to get their hands on, at the very least, the relic in the floating continent. That's no pirate cosplay, that's a king with a powdered wig! A and apparently syphilis? The majority of the time on the ship is spent stealthing around, weaving in and out of vents, and blowing up walls that are for sure within earshot of some pirates, Hey, not my post, not my problem, am I right, fellas? The ship lifts off and they work their way towards the bomb chute, which, given how many bombs are being deployed so soon after takeoff, Twig's family is getting absolutely bodied right now, good god. On the other side of the chute, they find Alphonse and the ship's armory and soon find themselves alone with Dirk. Despite Molstrom's doubts, Dirk knew that they would board the ship and end up here, because if they didn't, he was going to feel really stupid standing in the corner monologuing to himself. Alphonse tries to reason with him, as if that's worked at any point up to now. Rather than letting them advance to Molstrom, Dirk wants to take care of them before he finds out that they're here. Okay, obvious orgy joke aside, why is Dirk trying to solo this? Maybe Molstrom would want to help, but now he has to bang on the door from the other side. Hey Dirk! Come on, I wanna fight the treasonous theater boy! The Dirk fight is actually quite fun. It's fast-paced as you dodge Dirk's quick moves around the room. Knocking him provides him with a defibrillator shock, the final of which instills him with the power of friendship. He expresses pain, of which at first seems physical, but time shows it to be emotional, as in his final moments he expresses the grief he felt when Alphonse abandoned him. His mask breaks, revealing the gears in his head working overtime in this moment, and with his last breath, he utters. Otis presses forward and is met with the relics that Molstrom has collected, but no matter how hard he hits their cages, they remain taunting him. The only solution Alphonse sees is to grab the keys to the cages, which would be on Molstrom's person. In a moment of panic, Twig says that even though he's a great fighter, he doesn't think they stand a chance. Alphonse argues that when they saw Molstrom fighting last, he was fighting with the power of a relic, and since he doesn't have one right now, he should be significantly weaker, which reinvigorates Twig completely. He warns also that there's no going back after this, so they should do everything they can to prepare.
They enter Molstrom's quarters with a mixed bag of emotions as Twig declares that he will fall to their hands. He's amused by this more than anything, and is willing to allow them to entertain him while the relics continue to charge. Speaking of, they hear a commotion in their direction, which it's revealed that Solus was the hooded figure. Like timid, clumsy Solus? Like avoids eye contact in the change room Solus? He steals the relics and flies off board. Pirates on the ship try and fail to shoot him down and take immediate action to let Molstrom know that the Owlboy has stolen the relics. Solus is the titular owl boy. Man, they're really dragging Otis through the dirt. He actually is just a guy. Molstrom starts a tantrum and concludes that Twigophons were just sent here to distract him while Solus made off with the relics. So death is inbound until Getty comes crashing through the window, slamming a chopper into Molstrom. They take the time he's stunned to escape through Getty's new interior design innovation and seem to have had a pretty harsh landing. Solus watches over Otis lying unconscious and tells him not to follow him before they come into Alphonse's view and he flies away. The next scene happens in Otis's house with Getty where he admits that he wasn't really mad at Twig, he was just looking for someone to blame for what happened at Advent. I hope you told that to Twig too, because if not, this whole new dynamic is gonna get awkward. The others join and Alphonse tells the rest that he saw who took the relics, but understandably he doesn't recognize Solus. He thinks that Solus was using the pirates for their power to get a hold of the relics, but wasn't actually on their side, and that he's probably gonna use them soon because Molstrom has a bit of a temper in case you hadn't noticed. He saw Solus go way high up past the mesosphere. Okay, listen man, I can get behind pirates and robots, but don't go throwing around the word mesosphere like I'm supposed to know what that is. If Google wasn't around, I'd be so confused. A ship could get us up there quickly, but all the ships were in advent before... You know, so they gotta start looking for a way to get up that high, and I gotta say, nothing gets me higher than seeing my abusive role model sulking in the corner. This scene shows such a wide range of emotions that if you have any intention of playing this game, I think you should experience it for yourself. Agio suggests talking to the professor on how to get past the mesosphere. Professor uses his technology to see if there are any land masses past the mesosphere in the first place, and the display shows that there are. This excites Kurnell so much that she invites everyone into her home to talk shop, but that was a bait. The building was a rocket ship the whole time. If I could credit this game for anything, it's its absolutely insane juxtaposition. Our full group Twig Ghetto Fawns, good god. Crash land on the landmass where the air is too thin for Otis to fly in. On foot, they enter an incredibly grand castle with more owl statues, owl bookshelves, owl arches, owl pillars. Their vanity knows no bounds. In the castle's foyer, they encounter Solus, who is surprised that they made it here, but is excessively ambiguous about why he stole the relics and what he's using them for before running off. This castle relies on another cat and mouse scenario, but with more standard platforming because of Otis not being able to fly. Also, I don't know if you've ever tried those gross apple-flavored candy canes, but they got those here too. The group eventually comes across a large library where the only book in recorded owl boy history, Nocte, can be found. You ready for the lore dump? The owls discovered something called the loop that was a point of contention in owl society and caused riots. Whatever it was, it was something that was unanimously wanted to be stopped. A hex was created using the powerful relics that everyone's itching to get their hands on. They hoped to upend the laws of the universe, which was ultimately a disaster, and broke apart the world, hurling all land into the sky. They didn't like this outcome, and started developing an anti-hex to stitch everything back together and bring the world back under the owl's control. Getty ignores everything else that Alphonse read out and really fixates on that last sentence to conclude that Solus is just as power-hungry as Molstrom, and Alphonse agrees with him? I feel like I'm missing something here, because it sounds to me like Solus is gonna make all the land go back to the surface, which sounds particularly poggers for a flightless human like yourself. Following this is an outdoor portion where the group witnesses a mountaintop disconnect from its base. It seems that the upward force caused by the Hex so long ago is becoming too much for the world to handle and is sending it all shooting up into space. Alphonse also nonchalantly says that this is the end of the world, which is just hilarious. Since everything is rising anyways, Otis is able to fly again and enters a large lab where they finally catch up to Solus in the middle of a ritual. I hope this outburst has nothing to do with me questioning your owlhood. I think you're the biggest, baddest, dineral owl I know. Unsurprisingly, Solus isn't too thrilled about Otis attacking him, and even as the others try to convince him that using the relics would only cause a repeat of Advent, he isn't willing to listen anymore and begins his attack. He uses the power of the relics to teleport about, summon gusts of wind, and shoot lasers. Otis got a teleport one too, but I wish he could have just BAM! 
<laughs> Upon entering phase two, Solus brings everyone into a dimension that looks like it was pulled straight out of a mother game and adds an LED light strip to his repertoire, but goes down after a few extra bullets to the cranium. After this fight is finished, he makes it known to the others that his true intentions with the relics were to perform the anti-hex that was mentioned in the Book of Nocte, not destruction like Molstrom was using them for. Solus re-explains exactly what was laid out in the Book of Nocte again, while adding that the land masses weren't simply hurled into the sky, they've been rising slowly into space and are finally at a breaking point where everything is going to end up there soon if he doesn't finish the ritual. This would have been very useful information that he could have given instead of being so ambiguous the whole time. If he had just explained that to them instead of fighting, he may have been able to finish the ritual before Molstrom had become a problem. Is Molstrom a problem? Good lord, thy cometh! Molstrom crashes his ship into the lab and he's pissed! Solus takes a shot at reasoning with him before Otis steps in to try and werewolf out again before receiving the slap of a lifetime. Molstrom, being as jovial as he is, really doesn't care about saving the planet, which I mean like, come on man, it's the current year, grow up, and throws Solus away. Still having them in his possession, Solus infuses Otis with the power of the relics. Alphonse, Getty, and Twig use this time to start holding Molstrom back while Otis crawls to the totem that Solus was performing the ritual on that got knocked outside when Molstrom's ship showed up. The setup for this whole interaction is really weird and convoluted, sorry. The team holds back their opponent's offense. He's crawling. He's taking a Beyblade break mid-game. The totem is slurping him like an Allen's juice box. A sphere emerges from Otis's chest, which is presumably the anti-hex, and triggers right on top of Molstrom, also presumably destroying his... everything. We enter a similar dream sequence to the one at the beginning of the game where Otis meets up with a silhouette of Asio. He says that this is a vision of both the past and the future, and Otis talks. He asks, if everyone is okay, which Agio confirms. He mentions a few things that make his true identity a big question mark before parting ways. Cutting back to reality is a shot of Otis plummeting towards the surface, and a shot of a landscape, proving the results of Twigetto Fonz's efforts. What are my honest thoughts on this game? It's not fun. But even though this is the first time on the channel that I've talked about a game that I didn't like, the more I rewatched footage, re-experienced the story, looked deeper into interviews, and just thought about it, the more I grew to appreciate it. And what's with all that stuff with Asio at the end? Is he an ancient owl? I guess I probably could have learned more about that if I collected those owl coins, huh? Oh, and the loop. L like, it feels too on the nose for it to just be history repeating itself.